So welcome. Welcome, everyone, for this exceptional day for the Business and Economic Meeting of the Arab World Institute. And today we're going to talk about women. And I'm very proud here to be the moderator of this first round table on leadership and empowerment. What are the opportunities, the challenges, and the vision? And I would like here to introduce our four speakers today, four uh, fascinating women. Thank you very much once again for joining us. So starting with Morocco, Mrs. Uh, Nadia Ftalawi, Minister of Tourism, Air Transport and Social Economy. Thank you very much for being with us today, as indeed we are going to talk here about a very important subject, as you are also president of an organization that help women accessing to leadership. And with us, we also have Princess Intisar al Saba. you are a member of the Kuwait um, royal family, and you create a foundation, Intisar Foundation, and the purpose is to empower one million Arab women by 2040, and you use dance and laughter and theater to promote this objective, and we'll talk about it later. And then Salma Al-Rashid, who is the chief advocacy officer of uh, Saudi, Saudi Arabia, you also work for Al Narda Society for Women. So thank you uh, very much to uh, be with us today. And I will uh, briefly introduce our fourth spe speaker. So Chiara is a woman of the world indeed. I mean, she's been everywhere in the world. You've been the ambassador of the Grand Paris, looking for investors for years, but also starting in 2018, you're the president of Women's Forum. And it is about access to new technology jobs for women. So you were right that we need also to promote here the access to women. And you also are received the Légion d'honneur by Mrs. Christine Lagarde at the time. And Christine Lagarde is uh, nowadays uh, the head of the European Central Bank. So that's perfect. We have our uh, wonderful panelists for this first panel discussion. So let's get started. So sometimes words are important. Empowerment is a very important word, isn't it? And but you use it, we use it a lot for a lot of reasons. And this is why I'd like you first to give us a definition of empowerment. Just to tell us basically uh, how you're going to do that. So you, we can start with you, Mrs. Minister. What's your definition of empowerment? So first of all, thank you for your invitation and uh, for choosing this theme, which is very close to me, very dear to my heart. And I am sure all the ladies who are here today. And uh, for me, the definition, my own definition of empowerment is uh, to react, to be free. It's something that's very important, uh, freedom and to be independent. And this is manifested by the fact of uh, that you are able to lead and to accept this empowerment as an objective and to be a leader and often to make difficult decisions. That is my definition of empowerment. And how have you accessed empowerment? You have uh, worked in a masculine world, in the insurance field, 
uh, how could you, you know, if, if you could tell us a little bit about how you have access to empowerment in a male-dominated world. My career was in two steps. During the first 10 years, I worked in a very masculine world, in a very male world. And uh, I thought that was very strange to be here. You know, for me, it felt very strange. Um, there were some difficult decisions to make. Uh, they were not guaranteed to be successful. But uh, I took the challenge. Uh, and then in a second step, I was very lucky to work in an insurance group, which was very uh, female-led. And it was in this area that I was able to thrive without too many difficulties. Uh, it wasn't too difficult for me. It was quite a feminine, uh, female-led environment uh, in with regards to the uh, mission, the challenge, and things have happened quite quickly. In my group, I uh, noticed that we were an exception rather than the rule. And that's why uh, res the responsibilities were a little bit higher. I, I wasn't able to refuse them. And I was glad to take this opportunity. I wanted to be responsible, uh, it's the challenge. Did you have to the feeling that when you're a woman, you have to work more, prove yourself more, prove your competencies? Yes, I think so. And uh, that's something uh, um, uh, I am sorry about. As a woman, we always promote the best pupils. And uh, very often, you know, we are very hardworking, very disciplined. And uh, from my experience, I would like to put other competencies to the fore. We are also strategists, and we don't hear this very often as a, a competency as a woman. It's the baton that we have as a woman on our hands. Yes, we work hard, but that's not everything. In order to uh, work in a post that, uh, that you know, is better paid, we have to put all the qualities to the fore. We are strategists, we are visionaries, and uh, we work in partnership with other people in our companies. Thank you. I'm uh, going to give the floor to Princess Itisbal Sabah. Um, from the Kuwait, how do you feel empowerment is shown in the practice and what is your definition of empowerment? Thank you very much, everyone. I understood uh, French, but I prefer to speak in English. Pleasure to be among such inspiring and uh, awesome women, and I'm so happy and privileged to be here. Now, answering your question, Isabel, about what is self-empowerment and how I have empowered myself. I would like to take you on a little journey of a story of myself and, and what transpired in my life. So I am born to a very loving and a very loving mother and a loving father. I was not... Uh, Beaten when I was young, I was threatened to be beaten, yes, but I was never beaten. And I had a very easy, very nice childhood. And then I got married. Yes, I got married young. I got married at 20, but that was my choice. And all of a sudden, I'm in this life where I realize after three years that I'm being abused, mentally in the beginning and then physically later on. And thinking back now, like, why did I allow myself to be abused? I had all the means to leave. I never told my family I was being abused. I kept it a secret because I was ashamed of what was going in my mind and what was going in my life. And I'm telling you this to later get on to what is self-empowerment. So it took me about four years to get out of that very 
unhealthy, and I say unhealthy because it's unhealthy for me relationship. And all during this time, I believed I was not I was I, I was getting what I deserved, but I was not worth no, not even that. I, I believed that I had to stay there for different reasons. My children, what would people say? What would my family say? This is shameful. And I, I stayed there. I stayed there for four years. And then I left, thank God. And that has catapulted me to where I am now. And uh, so answering, what is self-empowerment to me? Men do it all the time. Women, we forget to do it. Putting ourselves first. Realizing we're worth being first. Not family, not society, not work, not children. Putting ourselves and our needs first. Once we realize that we should be first, we fill our cup in order to give others. And for Many years, I did not put myself first. And for many years, I was not self-empowered. I was disempowering myself by putting my children first, putting everyone ahead of me. So going back to your question, this, is, this has been my story, but it's also been the story of all the women we've worked with. Once they realize they come first, once they have that realizing, the realization that they are worth it and they deserve and they have every right to put themselves first, that's when they're powerful. Because being putting yourself first, forget what some people might say about it being selfish. No, it is selfless because only by being powerful inside of myself can I support my family, my daughters, my friends, my co-workers, and bring out the best in them. Because once I put myself first, I will allow them to put themselves first. And this, to me, is true in power. Merci. Merci, Princesse. Merci for your words. Thank you very much. It is a very strong way. To, to, you know, the reason I said that, and I said, it, and this is my story of shame, okay? And I'm saying it in public now. And this is one of the things we support our women to do. In private, in a safe place, to share their stories of shame, even small or big. Because once they voice their stories of shame, their stories don't hold them anymore. They are free. They are liberated to be the true embodiment of, of who they are. I kept my story, except for very close people, very closed. Once I had the courage to say it out loud, it no longer sh shackles me. It no longer pulls me down. And this is what's allowed me not to really... Uh, well, this is what's allowed me to grow and thrive in my life. And this is exactly what happens with our women. When they act their stories, when they, they put themselves in the shoes of other women and give different options so that other women can see what options they are. When they, uh, they stand up, they're standing straight, being courageous and speaking. Just being in the spotlight is very empowering, very empowering, and also very scary, but also very empowering. Bravo à tous là pour pour ce courage. Uh, justement, j'aimerais peut-être donner la parole maintenant. Right. Now I'm going to give the floor to Sabah Rashid, uh, who is uh, the representative of uh, the Saudi uh, women. How is empowerment? Uh, how, what does it mean for you? Does it mean that you have to take the power as a woman uh, in Saudi Arabia? And good evening to everyone, because I realize when it's a virtual event, we have people joining us from all over the world. I'd like to start by thanking Dr. Jack Lang for the kind invitation and the Institute's team for their incredible efforts in putting together this event. 
uh, it's truly an honor to share this virtual stage with an esteemed group of speakers and and what a what a, um, a moving uh, statements we've heard so far. I'd like to apologize in advance if some of my interventions do not respond directly to the questions, as I have no access to the interpretation, and I'm counting on um, the translation in the chat box. And thank you, Claire, for, in advance for that. Uh, okay. My okay. my French is at a three year old level, and I now very much regret uh, not continuing my okay. French class. <laughs> It's a okay. <laughs> so I, I, I believe in the idea that empowerment is a multi-level concept. Uh, just as um, uh, Her Highness uh, mentioned, on the personal individual level, it is building that sense of agency, uh, that, that, that choice, having a choice, and that sense of agency among women and girls through expanding their abilities to gain full control and have full control to be able to have influence over their lives and their environment, but also it's on the community level. It's ensuring that the environment where women and girls live and work is supportive through the creation of responsive and proactive policies, addressing systemic, structural, and sociocultural barriers that hinder women's full and equal participation in all spheres. So whether it's at home, on a personal level, at home, in the community, in the public, political and also private spheres. So really empowerment is working with, working alongside those who we are serving. And, and the idea that those we're trying to empower have the keys within themselves, like Her Highness mentioned, but their and their cups are full. But it is our role as those who are in a position to empower others to really help them realize that their cup is full, and what else do we need to do to ensure that they they fully utilize their full cups? It's ensuring that there are safeguards and safety nets put in place to respond to women's needs and their roles and responsibilities and their different circumstances. Women have different needs and different circumstances, and we need to respond to that with policies and an ecosystem that further empowers them. So it's really about leveling the playing field it's about creating equity to achieve full equality. Merci, uh, Salma. Merci, Salma Rachid, for this first intervention. Thank you very much, Salma Rachid, for the first intervention. And to give the floor to Clara Corazza, uh, uh, you have grown uh, in a male-dominated world, and I'd like to see how you feel about uh, empowerment you are a very inspiring woman, uh, a model for many uh, young girls who want to work in the economics, in economics and establish their own. Can you please tell us how you managed to climb up uh, and progress? Thank you very much, Isabel, and uh, thank you for you know that I'm part of this panel today, this round table. Since I was young, uh, you know, I'm talking about Lebanon, I grew there uh, in Beirut, uh, especially, it's close to my heart, and I love this world, this evolving world. And uh, with regards to modons, there are many of them in the Arab world, exceptional ones too. And uh, we think about the northern countries, we think that they're very advanced, but that's not the case. I'm going to tell you about a few stories uh, with regards to the Arab world. When you talk about empowerment, the most important thing is to be able to choose. And this uh, means the uh, uh, economic empowerment and also the fact that you can decide uh, about the life that you want to lead, about the society in which you live, to have the keys for success and the capacity to invent the uh, jobs of the future and uh, to allow women to transform things and to have a vision, to have the ability to have a vision, to put it forward, to have an ambition, not just for uh, ourselves, but for projects, and to be able to carry them out. And that's my uh, ambition. Uh, I want to raise mountains, 
I want to influence people to say what I want to do, to participate in the politics, to contribute to its general interest, to act, to be on the round tables. And uh, this, you know, you have to really be confident and uh, or to de determinate yourself. There are many role models who are inspire young people. I think it's very important. And also it's about networking and network. We don't say this enough, it's the positive energy of other people who give us strength. When we go to a forum, to a meeting, we don't feel alone, we are connected. We know we can succeed and I think that is really part of empowerment, this solidarity. Uh, the fact of having the same objectives and to lead them. It's easy said and done, it's uh, not easy in the practice. Uh, I would like to applaud the efforts that have been carried out in uh, some countries. I'm going to talk about uh, share various stories. As for myself, what has been the hardest since I was young, uh, with my uh, young two sisters. Uh, it was a shock trio, so to say. And I wanted to overcome my shyness, my, uh, you know, with regards to being a limelight, to talk in public. I like to be in the shadow, I used to like in the, uh, to, be, to be in the shadows, not, not to be in the forefront and if we don't show ourselves, if we are not there, then we can't progress. And that was my biggest challenge. And uh, after a career of 42 years uh, working with men, I think that's my story, really. And uh, for me, uh, I showed empowerment in 2009 when uh, 200 women from the Arabic world uh, took part in the building bridge building bridges between uh, Europe and the Arab world, then uh, I invited them not just as women. At the time, I was in the defense sector rather than anything else, and I wanted them to discover this world, and uh, it was amazing. We created bridges and exchanges, and uh, most of them became my friends. I had to be aware of the, wo the, the role of the women uh, talent has no gender. Uh, as Elisabeth Moreno said, a talent is a talent and it can be shown in various areas. And for women, we can say that I am here, I can make things progress, and it is a way to empower women. Thank you very much, Chiara. I think we can uh, identify in what you said, uh, we have to come forward and, uh, you know, maybe if we are sure, you know, uh, we can change things even then. And there are, you know, women who like to talk a lot who are confident and those who are shy and, you know, both can share that experience. And thank you for this uh, experience. So we are going to uh, talk about the second theme today and Kara, thank you very much because you uh, were a transition in this event, I suppose to say. Uh, there have been improvements that have taken place and on the uh, world, the market, the, the, in the world, uh, you know, the, the work world, working world, uh, there are, uh, th these ones are traditionally male and it is difficult to progress. Uh, to have important posts, uh, to take responsibilities, as you did. I have the question, uh, is it uh, more difficult or easier uh, as a woman in the Arab world to access leadership? Ariel, racontez-nous, qu'est-ce que vous pensez, quelle est votre analyse de ces So this is also something that you have to organize. 
So, Mrs. Uh, Nadia, it's your turn. Uh, il y a eu des progrès, certes. Il y a encore un mouvement, on va dire, positif et constructif uh, pour uh, encourager l'accès uh, des femmes uh, à l'emploi uh, et, uh, et au poste de, de responsabilité. Mais uh, on est vraiment loin du compte. Hein. On uh, ne peut pas se voiler la face. Et, uh, you know, uh, yes, but we have to be realistic. Uh, the crisis has reminded us how uh, we cannot take things for granted. We have a long way to go. And uh, after two or three months, we uh, went back and uh, it was very scary, really. Every step that we thought we had won, uh, we had to carry on fighting. Uh, things went as good as we thought. And with regards to education, In the whole world, we have millions of ladies, of girls uh, who cannot go to school and the key is education. Uh, whether we see the glass as a half full or half empty, uh, there is a lot to do to educate uh, young women, especially in rural areas, especially for higher education. The tradition is that uh, women are uh, more women at home looking after their families and uh, in spite of everything in universities in the uh, further education system the number of women is rising dramatically what is important for the jobs of tomorrow is that there are enough uh, young ladies and ladies who have an education level which is uh, good enough, uh, who can uh, have these roles. So we have to carry on with the uh, basic education and also encourage these girls who have been brave enough to go to university, uh, like engineers in Morocco, uh, where the number of women and men is about the same. There are about 150 countries in the world and many Arab countries where there is discrimination towards women. So we'll have to uh, have uh, legislation to stop this. Uh, we have to work on the financial uh, inclusion. We know they have uh, less uh, access to financing. They are not encouraged to be entrepreneurs and uh, uh, they are in management, but the entrepreneur, uh, the woman who has an interpreter, has to be encouraged. And what is very strange in the world, in our country anyway, um, many, uh, many women are, uh, you know, more in the, in some sectors. Uh, uh, very often women is uh, at home and this is accepted. Cette femme qui va travailler très dur, parfois sans éducation, dans des conditions compliquées. So for these women now, educating her children, well, of course it's for the destiny of your child so it is a responsibility for women and I think we sometimes hide behind our culture to refuse other responsibilities on leadership for women that are very well deserved so a lot to be done on education and also for the different uh, And on the networks as well, leadership networks. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, very clear. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Minister. And now I'll give the floor to uh, Your Highness in Kuwait. So how do you react here to what has been said? Uh, so do you also think that there is uh, sometimes because of religion or because of uh, other uh, gender stereotypes Women don't have access to some jobs, to some uh, to education. So, do you think it's the same in Kuwait and um, and with your foundation? 
how do you act to really help these women to get access to leadership positions? Continue on what uh, Her Excellency the Minister uh, said. So in Kuwait, we don't, we have a different narrative or a different circumstances. We have more girls being, well, more, more girls getting higher grades to enter university than boys. And we've had this for many years. So the, the, the government had to put a quota for boys entering med school and engineering school, because if they didn't put a quota, you'd get 80 to 90 cent women and 10% men. So we do know how to put quotas for men. We still don't know how to put quotas for women. Because men have demanded the quota. Women have still not demanded a quota of representation in uh, everywhere in the country. So our women are very well educated. And I think Saudi have the same, uh, uh, same thing. Uh, they, the med school... They get the highest grades, they excel in school, they excel in university, and they start working, and then that's where their glass ceiling hits. Their glass ceiling is not to get high grades and enter medical school. They do that easily. It's when they hit the workplace that their glass ceiling gets there. So in spite of having the first female head of a, 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 a national news agency, Kuna, the first female in the Arab world was in Kuwait. The first female to head a major university was from Kuwait. Uh, and we have a lot of success stories, but they're not connected yet. They work in silos. Yes, we get inspired by these amazing women, but we still have our own glass ceiling. I had my glass ceiling for a long time until I realized, oh my God, I am self-inflicting my pain. There is no glass ceiling to my thoughts, to my ambition. There is. The only glass ceiling is my thoughts and my ambition. And so for me, there's many things that can be done to break glass ceilings. Number one is for women to unite because women are amazing collaborators. Once we collaborate, we can do miracle. Well, again, going back to university, for the university to put a quota on 50% women, 50% men, there was an outcry from men, right? Because they could not... Families couldn't put their sons in schools or well, in university because they weren't being accepted. So they changed the law. If there's an outcry from women, this is the biggest shattering of glass ceiling. An outcry for governmental representation, an outcry for parliamental representation, an outcry for even foreign diplomatic representation. So far... In all three sectors, women are a very small factor. Even though in Kuwait, funny enough, women represent almost 50% of the workforce, yet in leadership, they have a very small representation. Is it the system? Is it the government? Or is it also our personal glass ceiling? I think it's all three. And I put 50% on our glass ceiling and the other 50% on all other factors. So for me, if, we, if, not if, for me, if one, we choose in Kuwait to break our glass ceiling, we will unite and break it together because we have to collaborate. We've been living for eons of years being told that men are superior. We need to believe that women are also just as superior, and we put ourselves first. Merci, merci, princesse, pour pour ces paroles qui sont uh, très claires. Um, justement. Uh... Thank you very much, Your Highness. Uh, here and uh, what about you in 
Uh, Saudi Arabia, I know that you also have some measures that were taken for empowerment of, uh, of women. We've heard a lot about driving, for example. Um, so I know that you've worked really hard so you could also have, um, you know, political figures. Uh, what about university? So do women have access uh, to the career of choices? Is it something that is changing? What are the obstacles remaining in Saudi Arabia? The car is not enough. I've been driving my car since I was 17. We celebrated being able to drive cars, but we recognized that that at the time was not enough. However, it is truly a pivotal time for women's empowerment in the kingdom. Uh, we've witnessed groundbreaking period of transformation focused on diversifying the economy. The kingdom's vision 2030 aims to build a vibrant society, a thriving economy, and an ambitious nation. This can only be achieved by, with the full, equal, and effective participation of women. A third of Saudi Vision 2030's goals have a social aspect, with women placed at the heart of the strategy towards prosperity. So there is this um, strong, um, this is guided by a strong political will to take action and initiate reforms to ensure the realization of the vision. And, the, you know, what Her, Her Highness mentioned about is it, you know, is it the systems? Is it women themselves? It's really a combination of what we see in Saudi. And, and, and the Saudi society is starting to reap the benefits of this movement. We now see an increase in women's representation and leadership positions across all sectors, with appointments of women in the Shura Council, which is our, our, the highest consultative uh, council, making up 20% of that council. The Human Rights Commission Board has 50% representation of women. We also recently celebrated the appointment of ambassadors, uh, women ambassadors and women at the rank of minister. In the private and uh, business uh, field, the Saudi Stock Exchange, which is one of the biggest uh, economies in the region, is led by a Saudi woman. And one of the country's largest banks is chaired by a woman. The World Bank uh, Group um, Women Business and the Law Report found that of 10 economies that improved the most in 2020, six are in the Middle East and North Africa region. So a lot of movement is happening uh, there and, and in our region with Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates ranking as the top reformers in the Arab world for two consecutive years. But in addition... And going back to Saudi, during uh, uh, last year, during the Saudi presidency of the G20, I had the honor of being the Sherpa or executive director of Women 20. And it, Women 20 is an engagement group that is um, independent of government, but it's mandated by ensuring that gender considerations are mainstreamed into G20 discussions and ultimately translate into the G20 leaders' declarations as policies and commitments that foster gender equality. And al Nahda, the organization that I work for, was the host of Women 20 last year. And, and we took the opportunity to host, of hosting this global forum to hold a series of national dialogues across the kingdom by organizing a participatory and co-creative grassroots process for identifying priorities and recommendations pertaining to women uh, or Saudi women's economic empowerment from the people. So this was led by a civil society organization. And the result was a list of 39 policy recommendations that will ultimately accelerate women's empowerment around the topics of inclusive decision making, labor inclusion, financial inclusion, digital inclusion, and women's entrepreneurship. Around 100 experts from different fields contributed to these recommendations with over 700 people participating. Eight of these recommendations were focused on inclusive de decision-making, recognizing that this importance of women's full, equal, and effective participation in public and private uh, life. And as mentioned with, by previous uh, speakers, really women are the head of households in our region, but, and they play an active role there. But it's really important to have the political will. We need to have the policies 
in place. As mentioned by Her, uh, Her Excellency the Minister, there are still um, policies that discriminate against women, and we're really hopeful to see these continued reforms. So when we remove these policies and, and eliminate all these legal barriers, then the, the, the um, sociocultural will follow. Merci, merci Salma Al-Rashid. La parole à présent à Kira Koradza. Euh, la princesse Intissar parlait des quotas <laughs> tout à l'heure. Thank you Salma, thank you very much. Uh, Kiara, we talked about quota. Mrs. Christine Lagarde also um, discussed the quotas for women. I'd like to have your opinion, Kiara. Could you also give us examples from the Arab world? Because sometimes it's quite surprising, actually, to hear that uh, in the STEM, we can see that in the, in the Arab world, there is a lot to be done. You don't have here this uh, evolution of a gender. So can you give us, please, your analysis here? So do we need quotas? Uh, so what is your assessment? So I'll start by the end of your question, because as I think uh, from what Sama said, uh, that's a good continuation. So last uh, year, I contributed under the Saudi presidency to the different work discussed, and I represented the uh, private uh, sector for, for France, and I think there's been a lot of advancement. And I also like to underline that there is a paradox here. There is some benefit in the Arab world, including uh, countries like in Algeria, where you have 50% of women that are in the STEM business, science, technology, mathematics, engineering, that really give you basically aspect to the changing world. So these are very important professions. And that's why I insist on the fact that men, women need the same opportunity as men to develop these skills to have the keys of success. So what I saw is like in Saudi Arabia, you have 50% of women here, uh, engineer. I've got friends in Kuwait that uh, have leaders in the banking industry, women. I'm talking about women. But also, like everywhere else in the world, and it's not a problem in the Arab world, you have 52% of the workforce, which represents women but that's only 30% of leaders. So if we had here this quality, gender equality, I think that we could decide by, we could create even more jobs and we could uh, basically add to the performance. So in Saudi Arabia, but also Canada and so on, these, these are just figures coming from all over the world. So it's a waste. I'm sorry, I'm going to use this term, but it's a waste not to use the talent of women in business. So actually, we can see that during the crisis here, you had like companies, there was uh, leadership, it was a women's leadership, but they outperformed their male-led companies by over 30%. And I will answer to your question on the quota, sorry, but as... um But the princess said, I think the problem is not about only about skills, because skills are there. I believe that the number of women being active, educated, having the skills, it's more like about stereotypes, conscious and unconscious stereotypes everywhere in the world. And I'd like to say that this is very common, even in the G7 country. So I'd like to share two figures first. So one person out of uh, four in the G5 countries are convinced that the brain of women is different from the brain of men, so that women need to dedicate their time to literature, whereas the men should be more scientific. So I'm talking about G7 countries here. So that's why that, you know, some girls will be told, don't do that, that's not for you. A second figure I'd like to share with you, because I think that's the key for the problem, 53% of women and men in the G7 countries are convinced that you cannot be a good mother and have a successful career. 53%. That's huge. So basically, we 
actually convince ourselves that we cannot do it. It's self-censorship. So this is why, compared to what you just said as well, and I think this is something that is very interesting, and I have a lot of uh, friends in the government, in the Emirates, when I was uh, drafting my proposals for the G7 to increase paternity leave, they said, oh, yeah, that's wonderful to have two week paid holiday. But what about two days before, before delivery? Because the mother can go to the clinic just thinking about giving birth. And the man has to deal with the whole logistics. And of course, you know, everything changes. So these are small ideas, but actually these ideas are very important. And this is a way we can change mentality. We can change mindsets. And that's important. And for quotas, it's the same. You cannot just have quotas if you don't prepare them. Like, you cannot decide that in the board of directors, uh, you... It, for the leaders, you need really people operational. If you just want professionals, you want the right people, and that's very important. So what you need is really to work on the pipeline so that you have engineers, cybersecurity experts, energy experts that can take the right decisions. And that's how you prepare here the pipeline. So I'm very favorable to quotas because you've seen the success of all those quotas. As, of course, we've got 46 now percent of women in a board of directors in France, but because of quotas. And that's wonderful for companies. It's not just wonderful for women. That's because it's important. It's very important here. And that's why before it was just like for um, women. So you professional, you professionalize, and that's why it's essential. And also, you know, it's a different uh, a process. I'm not saying that men are not as good as women or women are not as good as men. That's different. It's diversity. Diversity creates wealth. And it's the same process for the board of directors. And this is why I'm very proud that France took over here this challenge and included and on March 8 with the after discussions on how we can basically have a good representation in boards but also in the decision making institutions or bodies which is the governance of companies basically and it's important why because here again it is about promoting girls, women, to attract them to the business world and to retain this talent because it's very difficult to retain talent. And Salma, Nadia uh, also said that. How do you retain talent and uh, how do you make sure that they feel uh, comfortable in their careers? So this is why it's very important because these quotas need to make sense. So it is about the quality. Thank you very much, Chiara. Uh, time is going very quickly. We talked about women, entrepreneurship for women and quotas, leadership. This year, the question of the women empowerment and leadership, whether in the Arab world or all over the world, is a very important matter in this uh, difficult period. We've been in for the last year in this pandemic sphere, the crisis period, uh, which affects the whole world. It affects women first. Uh, as we said, you know, women take the weight first and uh, the Minister Nadia, uh, you are the Minister of Tourism, Transport, 
and uh, at uh, Ankara. You have seen this impact very closely of the uh, COVID crisis on women. Uh, what would you say about it, what you thought, and what are the factors which uh, we should use to enable women to, uh, you know, to help women with who are the most um, affected by the crisis? Yes, as you said, this crisis has uh, revealed in our societies uh, as some particular challenges and difficulties for women. They all have been incredible in uh, managing this crisis, uh, managing their households, teaching their children who were not able to go to school. They have uh, taken things in their hand with this crisis and uh, we saw that they were the first to lose their job and uh, were put in uh, partial employment and also with the, with the mistreatment of women. As I said before, I think things are progressing, but uh, we have to be very careful because at the slightest crisis, the temptation comes again to uh, question the role of the woman and to put her in a second position of uh, someone who is less able to manage the crisis. I don't think it's only for our countries, it's, it's everywhere. Uh, first of all, women uh, manage their households, look after their children, and they have to carry on uh, to carry on working. And uh, the decision makers didn't make things easy for them. It's a revelation of a universal situation of being in a situation where. Uh, you know, having a vision is more and more difficult. As you said previously, uh, apart from tourism, uh, which is in a very difficult situation now, we are working uh, on cooperatives. And what we saw in 2020 is that uh, many cooperatives were created by women because the women who face a crisis realize that working together in a, a unique format, a unique situation, has brought their creativity forward. And they have been very strong in this situation. And to conclude, what I wanted to say is that, uh, yes, things are in place, but things are fragile too. And uh, it's the time to say that as women, we are not happy that at the slightest crisis, uh, we'll uh, use the old methods and old ways of doing things. Uh, but we have to have uh, laws into place now to manage this crisis. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, time is going very quickly. We are reaching the end of these uh, expert panels now. So you want to, to empower one million of women and you are working on the ground <coughs> in the theatre uh, field uh, with dan dancing and uh, you are helping women to uh, be free and vulnerable refugees, but we're also working at the same time with uh, SMEs, so female SMEs who were affected by the blast. For us, they're both conflicts, they're both wars, wars they're both crises. And interestingly enough, it's not funny, it's, instant, inst it's, it's quite interesting that they both have the so same story, the same narrative. This one is from an upper middle class. This one is from, low, you know, she, before she was a refugee, she was lower income and also a housewife. And this one is a businesswoman. And they both have the same thoughts in their heads. 
they ha both have that glass ceiling that they are unable to do more. They are unable to get out of the situation they're in. And so we've been supporting both and we've seen changes in both. And it's, it's, it's interesting to see that one of our very, the most vulnerable of all women after the four months of um, drama therapy, imagine after four months, and she's done every kind of leadership program before. After four months, she realized, and this is going to shock you. Now, her husband is abusive. Her husband does not give them any money, and her husband has affairs in her bed. Okay, so this, and, and it's a really bad situation. After four months, she realized that she was making the money, he was taking it and beating her. It took her just four months of acting as the person she wanted to be to realize that she was making her money. It was her money. He had no right to take it. He had no right to beat her. He had no right to mistreat her. After four months, she decided to leave him and take their children because he was abusing all of them and live a new life. So the money was hers, but she accepted the abuse. So this is what I want to to highlight that with, with in, even business women, it's not anything more than what they believe they're worth. And that's why I keep always advocating for is women should support other women because when I support one woman, we break the glass roof for both. Imagine if I support 20 or 100 or 1,000 women. And as for quotas, my amazing, exceptional, glorious, uh, Kiara, I think you look beautiful today. The reason I say quotas in Kuwait, we don't have official parties. We have tribes and we have unofficial parties. And they're 100% male-dominated. And our culture is so stuck in this male superiority complex, and I'll say complex because we're equal, okay? No one's better than the other. That if the quota is not enforced by the government, women are not going to come out quickly from this old mentality of lack and low self-esteem. Tribe men will not allow women in unless they're forced to. Tribal women will not vote for women unless they're forced to. Merci Princesse, je sais, on pourrait parler vraiment de, et, et partager vos... Thank you very much, Princess. I know we could share your testimonies uh, for a long time. Uh, Salma Rashid, would you be able to give us a word uh, about the crisis and then we could conclude? Saudi Arabia are pleased that despite the pandemic, we have witnessed continued reforms to accelerate women's empowerment here in Saudi. There has been a steady increase in women's labor force participation from 25.9% in the first quarter of 2020 to 33.2% in the fourth quarter of the same year. Yet, we recognize there is still so much more to be done. What we as Saudis are witnessing today are important steps in the right direction. How, however, we must not rest. We must not be complacent. There is a risk to roll back progress, and we must continue moving forward. Thank you very much. Merci. Merci, Salma Al-Rashid. Chiara Koraza, on l'a vu, Davos vient de le dire. Il y aura, on, on va perdre 36. Very much, Salma Al-Rashid. Chiara uh, Koraza. Uh, we have been in this crisis for 36 years uh, to be able to be equal. Uh, we might need 136 years now if we carry on like this. So, you know, we really need to strengthen the role of women. I want to have a positive word. Uh, yes, the pandemics have uh, made things fragile. We risk going back to the Middle Ages, but we have an opportunity, a huge opportunity. Uh, we have to show that we are able to rise to the challenge. So I would like to have a, a new uh, renaissance uh, 
uh, where women would be at the heart of uh, decisions of the economics, of society, of progress, scientific progress. This Shikabel, I uh, give you, you know, I would really encourage you to uh, bring things forward and change the mentality, uh, the way of thinking. And uh, we will uh, uh, convince the head of state and uh, the political leaders and economic leaders as well that we can uh, improve things for all uh, so that everything is inclusive for everyone. And we encourage you to participate in uh, this and we need your support so that all over the world this message is broadcasted and uh, the issue is in your hands now. And yes, it will be done by women. Thank you very much, all of you, for participating. Uh, as I said, we'd like to talk a long time, but there are other round tables. Uh, and uh, it's a very busy day for us all. And I would like to uh, thank everyone who uh, took part in Arab world and all over the world. And please do stay connected. I will uh, introduce the second uh, round table after a little network networking break. Uh, the second round tables will from so what will the bridges be for the future? It will be very interesting. So thank you very much for your attention, for your participation and for sharing your experience. And uh, please do stay connected, stay in line.